Good afternoon and welcome to Clinical Pearls. I'm your host, Curry Bordelon. We are privileged to have Dr. Ashley Hodges with us today. Dr. Hodges is a professor and associate dean for graduate clinical education at UAB School of Nursing. She has over 29 years of experience in women's health and currently maintains a faculty practice at the Well House, a residential rescue center for women who are victim, uh, victims of human sex trafficking. Welcome, Dr. Hodges. And thank you for having me. So we've had a lot of conversation in the news. We hear in, uh, different uh, feeds and stories about trafficking, sex trafficking, human trafficking, and so forth. Can you tell us a little bit more about the differences? Well, one thing is we are hearing a lot more about human trafficking, and human trafficking is not new. But fortunately, we're getting the word out, uh, we're educating the public, and we're bringing people to justice that have previously not always been brought to justice. When we talk about human trafficking, there are two types. There's human sex trafficking and there's human labor trafficking. Sex trafficking is always labor trafficking, but labor trafficking is not always sex trafficking. So human trafficking, when you're talking about an adult, it is someone forced into a commercial sex act for money, for drugs, that are forced through use of force, fraud, or coercion. Now, when you're talking about children, you do not have to have the elements of force, fraud, or coercion. But for adults, those are the criteria. So how does sex trafficking occur? How, do, how does one get entrapped in that life? So there, there are many ways. And I'll tell you, it doesn't discriminate. Um, it doesn't discriminate races, um, genders, geographic location. Very often, like I said, it's through force, fraud, or coercion. Sometimes it is a younger person who is homeless or even an older person who is homeless looking for shelter, um, looking for food, and they suddenly become indebted to an individual who has had um, sinister or not so good um, uh, ideas about what they're going to do with this individual once they, once they get them food, once they get them shelter. And so sometimes it's an indebted. Other times it's through force where they actually physically take the person and they keep them from returning to their family, to their friends, to school, and they force them into a specific situation. Other times it's through threats of harm. If you do not do this, then I may harm your family, I may harm your children, I may harm your friends, or also threats to harm them physically, uh, whether it is physical abuse, sexual abuse, or threats of, of murder. Also, people can be tricked um, into this. And when we talk about this coercion, they may think they're going for modeling, or they may think they're going to a party, just a party as anyone else would go to. And what they find out when they get into that situation is that it's that's not the case, that the intentions are to lure this person into sex trafficking. So what's the most common method of, of luring, them, luring them in? You mentioned about coercive behaviors, such as uh, advertising for modeling or advertising for something that sounds really appealing, that hook, if you will, to pull them into that belief. What's one of the more, more common methods of people becoming uh, part of that? Well, one thing, the problem is we don't know everybody that's being sex trafficked. It is highly underreported. Um, and so, but what we do see is it's a mix. And very often they use more than one measure to lure these people into sex trafficking. Very often these women may feel these are their boyfriends or may refer to them as their husbands or their friends. And they may not even see themselves that they're being sex trafficked. They may see that they're in a relationship where they have been asked to carry out a commercial sex act. We need money for bills. We need money to pay the rent. We need money for food. And they don't necessarily see that that actually is sex trafficking if they're being forced to do that. And that gets into the point I'm often asked, what is the difference between commercial sex and actual sex trafficking? And, and, and there are different definitions, but when you look at commercial sex that do not have the elements of force fraud or coercion, we don't necessarily consider that human sex trafficking. The problem, though, is that many women may not recognize that there's one of those elements. So we, we don't want to say, well, this person's in commercial sex by their own doing, that they have no opposition to this, they're not being forced, they're not being coerced, because they may not realize that. 
Do some of do the laws uh, associated with sex trafficking vary from state to state? Do you see a lot of disparity? Not really. Um, the the local response may be a little bit different by police department, um, but I will tell you that the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI works with the State Bureau of Investigations, and they are very consistent in their responses. The nice thing is that there is a National Human Trafficking Hotline, and if you reach out to them, they have the resources within your state that can respond in a timely manner. What about age disparities? Do you find a certain age group who uh, who first enter uh, this this behavior? So if you look at the literature, it says that women often enter between the ages of 12 and 17. Others may say 14 to 17, but we do know that this happens often when they're younger. And what we see, we have what's called the ACEs survey, and that's the Adverse Childhood Experiences Survey. And we find that, ch that children or adolescents or even adults who have a higher ACEs score, higher score for adverse childhood experiences, that they are at greater risk. For example, if you have a child who was um, was not cared for at home, say they did not receive proper nutrition, that they were allowed to come and go all hours of the day and night, that they were wandering the streets, they may come across someone who offers them shelter, who offers them food, and they're, they've been neglected, and so they're going to take advantage of that offer. But what ends up happening sometimes is that they do get the food, they do get the shelter, and then they're indebted to this individual. So it happens across all ages, but with children, uh, you do want to look at what their childhood experiences have been, what their support at home has been. Um, you want to look at drug use in the home, uh, but that's not to say that this does, this, this also happens in homes where you can't, there, there is no, uh, there is no divorce, there is no drug use, there is no neglect, there is no abuse. It can happen across the board, it doesn't discriminate. So you mentioned some uh, different, some of the different risk behaviors that puts people in category mm -hmm. of uh, potential mm -hmm. uh, for that, this particular. Do you see drugs? Uh, any substance misuse disorders as part of this? We do, um, because very often individuals who are in, who are traumatized, who are dealing with depression, anxiety, homelessness, may be more likely to be involved in um, drug use. One thing we do know for sure, though, is that where you find illicit drug use, you very often are going to find sex trafficking, and that's because I can sell a crack rock one time, but a person can be sell multiple times over and over again. And when you're caring for these women, it's important to understand that drug use in these women, sometimes it was going on before they were being sex trafficked, but very often this is something that they were introduced to once they were in a sex trafficking environment. And so if you're being forced to stay awake for days at a time in order to make a certain amount of money so you will not be beaten, um, so you will not be in trouble, you're very often going to use stimulants to stay awake for long periods of time. When you're going through that severe trauma, when you're being exploited in such a manner, these women often turn to drugs to help or alcohol to help them cope. And so as healthcare providers, it's important that you take into consideration that these simply may be behaviors to cope with the situation they're in. Is there an average of how long people, once they're in, in a trafficked uh, environment, how long they stay there? Uh, it, it varies. And again, it's not, it's so underreported that we don't even know what the impact is. We don't know what the numbers are. And with the, the we say that women will generally, once they're in trafficking, there's some literature that says that they'll survive maybe 18 months. But I will tell you, I, I've seen women who have been trafficked for 30 plus years. So how does social media play in this? Meaning that, you know, we hear these stories of different uh, social media platforms and or apps or, mm -hmm. or so forth that actually have a covert background that, mm -hmm. that happens drawing people in. Can you talk right. a little bit more about right. that? Right. Well, and social media has been good and bad. Okay. It's been good from the aspect that we're getting the word out a lot faster. Um, we're not relying on print to get the word out. We are, you can 
quickly see what's going on nationally, good and bad, to alert people, to educate people. And so we're using social media as a platform to educate women, to educate young women. And I keep saying women because that's the population I work with, but I want to be clear that this happens to men as well. Um, and so we, but this, this gets the, the message out a lot faster. The downside to social media, and, and the public is familiar with what happened with Backpage. Backpage was shut down um, by the government because they were accused of actively, they, they knew and they promoted um, uh, and did nothing to intervene on people who were being advertised for sex trafficking purposes. There are other social media sites though, and so you want women to be very careful, and men, with dating apps, dating apps, you don't always know who's on the other end. And so there's always been a lot about catfishing and other issues and, and people sometimes will say, oh, they met someone and they, it was an old picture. Well, things that go on sometimes are a little more sinister than that. It may not actually be that individual you're talking to. It may be a pimp or it may be what's called a bottom girl who is in the, with the trafficker and helps to monitor these women helps to help the trafficker in, in the sale of these women and making sure that they're behaving and bringing in their money. And so you have to be very careful on dating sites. So the same things apply. The same cautionary tale applies. Make sure that you are, uh, you know, you're meeting these people in a public place for the first time. Don't give out private information about yourself. Be careful what pictures you share because once they're out there, they're out there. But we're also seeing other sites that children, adults use for social media that now there is rumor and there is some evidence that traffickers have now invaded um, and are starting to use those mediums as well. So I'm assuming the federal government's involved on uh, multiple levels yes. throughout this whole process to, to regulate and right. to monitor right. uh, these different social media platforms right. since it's being used in that manner. Right, and, and the government's very involved. I mean, they are, they, they are truly dedicating resources to combating this. But they're also watchdog groups who take it upon themselves to watch these websites, to watch social media, um, and, and see what's going on and, and report that to the police if needed. So we've spent a, a good bit of time talking about the background of trafficking. We've also talked about some of the, the risk behaviors and things and how women, or, or men for that matter, are both trafficked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Human trafficked individuals, sex trafficked individuals, get into those uh, into those behaviors. Can we talk about how we break that cycle? So, how do you? Uh, and we'll get to talking about your wonderful work at the Well House in just a few minutes. But how do people get out of that cycle? Uh, being trafficked. Um, there are several ways. Um, sometimes women, literally, or men, just escape the situation. Um, often they are brought into the prison system, jails into the prison system, and the great thing is that those systems are now working with rescue centers to make sure that they are not sent to a, um, just back out into the public if they are willing to go into a rescue center or into a shelter. And I think the education of our police departments has been critical and they're doing a fantastic job. The organizations that are educating them and also the police departments themselves and identifying these women and getting them into shelters because that is one way to intervene is to get them away from that situation and give them time away, get them into a good place mentally and physically because not only, as you can imagine, they have a tremendous impact. This has a tremendous impact on them mentally, but also physically. They're not, they're generally very unhealthy. They're not in good shape. They have not been able to take care of themselves. And so those are different mechanisms by which they can get involved. There's also a National Human Trafficking Hotline that I mentioned. Um, they have a crisis line that someone can call and they will help them with resources, telling them where to go and so forth. So that is also a good um, organization. The Well House, which is outside of Birmingham, Alabama, they actually have a crisis line as well. So anyone can call that crisis line and seek help. So let's talk more about the Well House okay. because my understanding <laughs> is it's a huge asset within right. the community and it, it provides right. a safe space for, the, for women or mm -hmm. trafficked mm -hmm. uh, individuals to be able to come to a place 
to start regaining control and surviving right. Right. Uh, this event. So the Well House is an amazing place. Um, the Well House is in outside Birmingham, Alabama, and it is the largest residential rescue center for women who are victims of human sex trafficking. They can house 25, 35 women and just added transitional apartments, so we may reach up to 40 women. Um, the sad part is that we need that many beds, um, but the good part is that the resources are there. And the Well House is a faith-based organization, um, nonprofit that focuses on the whole cycle from rec recovery back into integration into the community. And so women can stay there up to three years, um, and it is a very organized program. And they're not the only one in the country, though. though. There are other centers, other shelters that are involved as well in this process. Can we talk about some of the resources within the, once someone reaches out to you or once the corrections facility mm -hmm. or once someone in the law, in law mm -hmm. enforcement reaches out to you and says, I have a potential person mm -hmm. that needs help. Mm -hmm. What's that next step? So what, if they reach out to the well house, what they will do is they will arrange if it's a good fit for that person to be placed at the well house. Sometimes that's a bus, a bus ticket. Sometimes that's a car ride. Sometimes that's a plane trip. Sometimes law enforcement brings them to the well house themselves. Um, and so once they are identified and placed and determined that the well house is a good place for them, they are brought in. And those first few days are really still rescue. <laughs> um, they are rescued. They are, they are helping them to cope with the immediate emotional and physical needs. I mean, we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You're dealing with trying to find them clothes to wear. Um, you've got their shelter, finding them food, but also their basic needs. Uh, this, they, they finally have a place to sleep that's their own. And so helping them to, to adjust to their environment. Now, sometimes these women will go out of state. Um, this, there's a wonderful relationship between the rescue centers, and they determine where is the best place for these women to go. Sometimes it may be another state and they may transfer them there, but we do have people from out of state who also come to the well house. So do you have drug treatment? Uh, within uh, the facility? So within the well house, we have relationships with organizations who do um, detox. Um, we have relationships um, with one organization who's affiliated with UAB, Beacon Recovery Services, and they've been wonderful as far as helping these women um, detox through the process, but also kind of the long-term care. They have a program within the, a 12-step program within the well house um, that they go through. But also these women need individualized therapy very often because their stories are all so unique. And so we bring in specialists, we bring in people who are qualified to, to deal with that. So you mentioned earlier talking about how poor health they, most of these women will have, mm -hmm. or most of these people will have, mm -hmm. poor health, poor nutrition, I'm sure, right. as well. What type of complications do you find once they're there beyond uh, the substance misuse disorders? Right. What other type of complications do you see nutritionally? Well, nutritionally, you figure they're coming. They're not coming from a, a place where they've been eating um, a, the the food pyramid. They've been following the food pyramid. I mean, this has really been. They have been eating what was available to them. Very often, that's fast food. Um, that's maybe gas station food. Um, that, that may be food that they had where they were living, but with a lot of processed foods, high sodium. Um, they haven't necessarily been getting the protein they need. So we. When they first come in, we may actually see what looks like some early renal disease, early kidney disease. And that's very um, alarming when they first come in, but what we've come to realize is that once they get on a good diet, they become hydrated well, um, they're getting some good sleep, we really adjust their lifestyle behaviors, we see that resolve on its own. In addition, when they come in, very often it'll look like they have pre-diabetes. Um, and so we will watch carefully their hemoglobin A1Cs, we'll watch their blood sugars, and what we find again is as they get on a good diet, that that actually, for most cases, resolves on its own. Do most all of your, uh, your survivors in the well house, do they have to go outside of the well house to find uh, care or mm -hmm. is care provided directly within the well house? Well, that's, that's a great story. <laughs> So we were very fortunate at the UAB School of Nursing um, in 2017 to be able to start a clinic at the Well House. And we call it the UAB oh, wow. Clinic at the Well House. Uh -huh. And it has been a beautiful partnership. What it has done is it brought clinic services 
to the well house. One day a week, um, either I go out there, I'm a women's health nurse practitioner, or Dr. Lauren Mays, who's also um, faculty, who's an instructor here at the School of Nursing, is a family nurse practitioner, and she goes out there as well. And what we do is we can see the women there, because what happens is very often these women are taken to whatever providers will see them. Um, you know, they very often don't have any insurance and the facility is generally picking up the cost of this. And so they take them all over to whatever provider they can find. And I will tell you, there were some amazing, amazing providers who were providing care to residents at the well house before we opened the clinic. And I don't ever want to fail to acknowledge that because the care they gave to these women was, was exceptional and they did it truly um, truly, it was a it was a, a mission for them. So we um, we actually now though these women don't have to go other places. They see the same provider. They see a female provider, and very often that's so important to them. And so the fact that they establish a relationship with us as providers that they um, that they don't have to go out. They come to put in their pajamas sometimes, which we don't encourage. But if it's first thing in the morning, I'll <laughs> right. let them get away with it. Yeah. Um, but they can come then. Also, if there's something acute they need, um, they can come right up and don't have to wait for an appointment. So it's fantastic. It really is fantastic. They can get their services there. So let's talk a little bit more about healthcare providers okay. because you know you've talked about different entry points for 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 survivor for people trying to mm -hmm. escape that environment, which are uh, you know uh, police officers, mm -hmm. a hotline, mm -hmm. and so forth. If providers are seeing people in emergency rooms or in clinics, what are some signs that they could look for uh, as potential? Um, Trafficking behavior. And that's a great question because that is where healthcare providers really come into this. And these individuals generally are not going to have their annual visit with their PCP, <laughs> you know, with their primary care provider. I mean, it's not that it, it happens, but it's not as likely. What we see is that they often present to emergency departments. Um, it may be drug related complaints, alcohol related complaints, um, injury complaints, broken bones. It may be um, it may be that they have uh, urinary tract infections, they have sexually transmitted infections. Um, so they may present with that. And urinary tract infections are a very common uh, complaint that they come in with to emergency departments. Also, they may be seen in urgent care clinics because if they have a sore throat or they have an ear infection, they may be seen there as well seeking help. Another thing that we don't always think about is dental their dental status. And so if they have an abscess tooth, again, they may present to a, uh, an urgent care, they may present to an emergency room, and it may be, we need to really look at why are they having such dental complaints. And with women who are being trafficked, they may, through a physical abuse, may have problems, poor dental care, they don't necessarily have access to dental floss all the time and, and to regular brushing. Also, remember I mentioned what kind of foods they're eating. So they may be high sugar foods, and so that's causing dental carries. And also we have to think about drug use. We know with certain substance use that that also causes dental problems. So when you think about them presenting to one of these areas, regardless, it may be a labor and delivery unit because if they're having babies, very often they will deliver within a hospital um, So which or a health department. So what they have to look for, and I wish I could say there was one thing. Um, there was one golden thing or one great question you could ask that would get to the bottom of it, but it's not. Um, it is putting pieces together. And I always tell students, I always tell new practitioners, if something doesn't seem right, it may not be. <laughs> it probably isn't. And so look at the complaints they're coming in for. Also, are they new to the area? Um, do they move a lot? Do they know where they are? They may know they're in Alabama. They may know they're in Alabama, but they may not know what city they're in. Or they may know they're at the hospital, but they may not know the name of the hospital or clinic. So ask that. Also, do they have access to their own identification? Um, do they have their own driver's license? Are they have in control of their identification? That's another thing to look at. Also, are they avoiding eye contact? Are their behaviors with the healthcare provider very passive? Are they avoiding really engaging the healthcare provider? That is another thing. Is someone speaking on their behalf if they have someone with them? Is there someone else answering for them or always insisting they be present? Now, those things 
can all be benign and there can be nothing to them. But what you want to make sure is take all that in together. And then if you suspect that there is something going on, you can start asking questions. And you don't want anyone else to be in the room while you're asking them, if possible. No, no other family member or no one who's accompanied them to their visit. And what you want to do is you want to start asking questions. Do they feel safe? Um, are they in control of their own money? Um, with the, their what do they do for a living? What is their job? Um, are they free to leave their job whenever they want? Those are the type of questions you can ask. Because what you don't want to say is, are you being sex trafficked? Now, are there some times that women may say yes? Absolutely. But the majority of the time, one, they don't even know they're being sex trafficked, or two, they're not going to admit it, admit it to you because they don't know what kind of protection you can offer them. And they're afraid once they get that ball rolling, their life may be in danger. And their fears are real. It is, a, it is realistic. And so we have to be very um, sensitive to that fact. You mentioned the hotline, the crisis hotline mm -hmm. earlier. Um, mm -hmm. Is there other resources available to providers or the community to find out more cues, like right. you just mentioned? Well, there's a there are many groups, and there there are many providers out there. States have very often states have their own task forces. Cities may even have their own task forces, and so you want to become familiar with the resources in your area. There's also, when you go to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, there's Polaris, and Polaris will give you a lot much, a lot of the data that you're looking for, um, the best that we can get. Also, if you look at the Department of Homeland Security, uh, they're very involved. There's what's called the Blue Campaign, and you can look that up as to what's available. Um, there's um, the HEAL Network, that, that's a group that are healthcare providers that are all, uh, involved in looking at ending and supporting human trafficking victims but there are many resources so as you know as we as we start tying everything together you've provided us a tremendous amount of resources you talked about a great community resource mm -hmm. within uh, within the city uh, also different online or phone call based resources the community based resources um, what final thoughts do you have for, for people who are watching as far as right. how can you uh, become more involved right well the first thing I want people to realize is that this can happen to anyone Please don't think just because you live in an upper middle class neighborhood that your, your family's closed, that your children are talking to you, that this, this isn't a possibility. The way this happens is, is it creeps in. They, they manipulate the individual, whether it be a woman or a man, into believing this is a relationship, in, that you need them, or they put them in such a compromising position that they are afraid not to do what this person says. And with the women I've cared for, that's what I've seen. It may simply be that they just needed food. I had a woman one time who said, I just needed a shower. That's all I needed was a shower. And she ended up, well, you owe me. If you do this for me, we're even, or I'll, I'm going to beat you. And so she did this for him. And then it, that wasn't the end. Because what did I say? You can sell them over and over again, and it is a cycle. And these women are so stigmatized, and these women, very often they may have uh, criminal charges that have been pressed against them. They may have a drug history. They may be actively using drugs. Don't let that cloud your vision. Whether you be a health care provider or you be someone in the public, don't judge them. You don't know why they're in that situation. And so you want to make sure that you are offering them the services that you are aware of. And so if you're aware of the hotline, National Human Trafficking Hotline, if you're aware of the well house, great. Call, see something, say something. If truly you feel like, I don't, I don't know what to do, I need to call police, you can also do that as well because they are trained to intervene. And so it's important that we go into it with an open mind, that we realize that this population of women, this isn't new, okay? And people are starting to realize that. People are starting to talk about it. Um, we talk about whisper words, whisper words being words in social settings that we don't like saying out loud. We whisper them. And it's important it's not a whisper word, that we talk about it openly. Excellent. 
You have a very unique position that you're uh, in clinical practice mm -hmm. along with being faculty at mm -hmm. the School of Nursing. Mm -hmm. When you interact with students specifically about this topic, any a little additional tips specific for students? Right. Um, well, kind of twofold because one, I want them as a healthcare provider to be able to recognize the signs and then I teach them about what it's called trauma-informed care. We're now starting to look at survivor-informed care and how we integrate those principles in how we care for those patients. But also I teach students to be careful <laughs> because they're at risk. Um, their, their friends are at risk. And so I talk to them about staying in groups, being careful with social media and dating websites, being careful when they go to parties or bars, and actually educate them also because they're potential victims as well. well. Dr. Hodges, this has been a very intriguing conversation, something of great value, especially for the community and for, and for victims and survivors. So we appreciate your time. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for Clinical Pearls. We look forward to seeing you next time. If you liked this video, please remember to like and subscribe and click the bell icon to get instant notifications when we release new videos. For more information on how to get CEU credits or for more on the UAB School of Nursing in general, check out the description below. Thanks for watching.